Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are here to hear Emir Kusturica, who is one of the most famous filmmakers of the last 30 and some years. He has won numerous prizes, uh, the Palme d'Or at Cannes twice, the first time for one of his early films, which was when my father was away on business, uh, which was a critique of uh, Tito's Yugoslavia, and the second uh, time that he won the uh, Palme d'Or was for Underground, which was an allegory on the fall of Yugoslavia. He's also a controversial figure, as some of you no doubt realize, and he has chosen to speak today about multiculturalism, which uh, is a subject that is of keen interest to the Institute. The Institute is very pleased to receive him. Uh, uh, his visit coincides with the mission of the Institute, uh, which is to provide a platform for differing views. And uh, Emir Kusturisa will no doubt live up to that mission. Uh, we have the following format planned. He will speak for some 20 minutes. I shall launch the discussion thereafter. And then we'll open the floor to questions. I repeat questions. Uh, that will take us to the point of departure his remarks. And that will go on until 4 o'clock. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mr. Kusturisa. Thank you. Hello. I believe I will be not lonely here, so I realize that I have to speak about things that in between rationality and my emotional side is going to be very difficult to divide those two elements that we all carry on in our uh, luggages, uh, brain magazines, memories, and all what uh, from which we could say that we are made of. Uh, Speaking about, the, about multiculturalism, we could start from uh, the toponyms and from etymology in which when you say multi-cult, you don't even need to finish and to form a culture. You could immediately re, uh, uh, dis discover uh, the controversy that these two words produced by being put together. But I think the idea of creating societies in which people learn and live uh, together, we don't need to go uh, more than into the Old Testament, and we could find easily the idea of Babylonia. We could go to Baghdad, and we could go to our first memories from cinema, in which uh, one of the films that created my mind about the big multicultural cities was the film which was called, uh, not very politely, A Thief from Baghdad, in which, in fact, we have a basic idea of what is the connection in between different cultures. Somebody comes on the marketplace and tries to sell some goods and somebody else is buying it. In the meantime, we have a God that we believe in. In the Mesopotamic times, we had a very particular idea about Gilgamesh during the period of uh, uh, pyramids and Egypt, which is in fact something that comes much uh, earlier, but also is connected to where we all come from in Europe, which is Hellenic tradition. And I must start with a joke that was made by two tourists from, from Serbia when they started going to Egypt, Turkey, and all these countries where they could go to the seaside. And they were swimming and watching 
pyramids, which looked uh, huge, monumental as they do, but from the, the vision of a uh, swimming person, the pyramids looked even bigger. So one of those who was concluding uh, said to the other one, which in Serbian language uh, sounds much funnier than in English, because I cannot find a good expression, so I will say in Serbian, and I'll try then just to, to describe what does it mean. Just to put emphasis on how big things for the small people could mean even that the biggest architect, uh, biggest architecture, architecture in the world could be developed from something that is not very legal. So the guy was asking the other one, what do you think, how was it made? And he said, to mora da je bilo neko veliko muljanje. Which means, it was, I believe, the pyramid was made with the greatest possible difficulty and doing the worst possible things you one can do to, 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 to create a formal artifact outside. So this brings me to uh, nowadays in which I think we could all start thinking about multicultural uh, idea, which means contradictory element to be erased by the power of system, which means uh, in the Roman Empire during the uh, during the, the, the period of, of flourishing idea of law and, and art, we were, uh, I, I have found many elements which were speaking about trying to make a huge place where you could hear many languages. And they, some of the poets say that in, in the city of Rome, in the period, in the golden period, uh, of Roman Empire, you could have heard almost all languages from all the, the parts of the empire, which was compared to nowadays, we could say that uh, American Empire is almost having the same number at the same places, military boots. So going to the roots of uh, the market, I think the market is the one where we could grow the elements of how people start communicating and how people start even thinking to create something that could be good for both ethnic groups, religious, and all what is, uh, I would say, uh, necessary to make the uh, normal or regulated social life. It varies and it changes from how far you from the center of empire and how far you go to the outskirts of empire. If you go to New York today or 10 years ago, you could hear almost every language. And we could say that uh, in the center of empire, we have uh, the proof that empire is empire, not just by the boots all over the world, but also by people's belief that technology is uh, ultimate expression of what we feel and what we think. And if you go to any metro station or any place where people have a pose, everybody is looking at the, the small tool like identity card. I'm speaking about this because I come from the place where identity means everything but not mobile phone. Because of the mythological dimension of our past and because of the fact that it's not the same to measure how people are ready to exchange goods and how people are ready to live together in New York, where you have federal reserves which could cover the world by the money and by the power. Or if you go to, I don't know, city of Zavidovici or city of Kakanj or any place where you could imagine how people can communicate normally. In the place where I was born, before we started participating in the new history by liberating our land from occupants, 
Unfortunately, we have some statistics that are not uh, saying uh, that we are good ground for what we called multiculturalism. Uh, before Gavrilo Princip killed uh, Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, not in Vienna, we had about 89% of people illiterate. And one once asks the questions, why all these people during the war or 90s were speaking badly and not, uh, uh, not spotting what happens before the crimes were made, uh, we could instantly uh, come to the sample of a problem of misunderstanding. Because if you approach illiterate man as if he was reading Thomas Mann or all classics, you are making uh, fundamental mistakes in your belief, if this is belief or just tactics. So I'm speaking now like the one who is mostly interested into uh, existence of multicultural uh, society. Why is that? Because I was raised, I was born and raised in the uh, family in which all participants, mother, father, everybody who was touching my soul, passing by, was in fact not uh, against and not filled with the hatred. But unfortunately, I am not a good sample because of this. During the Tito's Yugoslavia, which was uh, creating some of the best samples of the existing communist pattern of life, you could say that Yugoslavia was uh, the luckiest, not the best, the luckiest combination of different elements. But when the war uh, came in uh, the 90s, and I don't want to speak about who is guilty for what, we could say that we lost one uh, society that was on good way to transfer to a better period. Why this did, 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 didn't happen, uh, we, could, we could have uh, many sessions to, 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 to discover what happens. But in fact, it was a good side of being multicultural. Apparently, you had the city of Sarajevo, which is the center of Yugoslavia, which was uh, strictly, which had a strictly kept eye on the secret police. And apparently, Sarajevo started producing good documentaries, first rock and roll, which was uh, kind of typical for this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, area that goes from Croatia to Macedonia. Apparently, the symptoms of Together's life started working. But in the end, we discovered that it was just a symptom. It was not the, by the nature of market that I was mentioning before, in which people gather together because everybody needs some pieces that somebody else is producing. But if you go to this spiritual side, if you go to uh, the elements of life which are contrary to what, what was in the end, then you see that these symptoms were feeble. They, they were not strong enough and they were not uh, growing from the roots of the possibility to put together Muslims, Croats, or Bosniaks, uh, Croats, and Serbs. We have suffered location problem because no one else in the history of Europe, I think even the history of the world except Middle East has a, such a uh, tr uh, could, could, could describe your position as a troublemaking because of uh, the three elements. Ivo Andrić, who is our Nobel Prize and who was, whose biography, especially political biography, is a biography of a man who fought for what we could call today multiculturalism, and who was going deeply into the substance of what happens to the three different ethnic groups and three different representatives of three uh, 
three uh, religious groups. So when he was speaking about how Serbs, Croats, and Muslims hated each other, he was not making propaganda to this hatred. He was just noticing something that always in the history was coming up when some big things happened. And I could conclude that in fact our area, out of Andrich's discourse, our area was suffering when Europe in the last 200 years was uh, starting to have some sicknesses we were always given before prescriptions to start taking medicaments. And then, in fact, we were circling around with something that came out as a most difficult part of the history in the World War I, World War II, and even in the, in the War of 90s. Ivo Andrić was speaking about a love for the Balkan people that is too far, Serbian looking to Moscow, Muslims looking to Mecca, and Croats looking to Vatican, in which this triangle, as a man who was changing religion after noticing what happens in a uh, concentration camp of Jasenovac, he was baptized as Ivo Andrić, a Catholic Croat, and he rebaptized himself into the Orthodox Christian because he cannot stand what happens in during the period of World War II when the in the concentration camp estimated hundreds of thousands of people being killed. As a result of uh, this killing, we had this conception of Yugoslavia in which as Marshal Tito was saying, we had to keep uh, our brotherhood and unity as an eye of our brother, something like this. It's difficult to translate because this, all these slogans are too political. And we kept it, but we kept it on the, so we kept uh, multicultural unity in the country that was consisted from six republics, uh, all religions and everything that was very experimental. But when the time came to see how do we uh, sustain our uh, society by being rational, to divert our emotions from what is history behind us, what is the, the future, we were not able to, 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 to come to the logical side of what could be leading to the better life and avoiding the war. Uh, very often we do mistake by believing that uh, we're mixing civilization and the culture at the same time. And I think in our, in our country people did it largely. But if Babylonia is possible, if, if we could live together in the certain places, I think it's very much uh, connected to the uh, conditions under which and geographical place where you could develop uh, multi-ethnic and multicultural society. I have one example, which I think is the strongest point and the argument that I have today. We were playing one concert in the island of Reunion which is very far away from here and which is close. We were all believed that we play in Madagascar. Nobody heard about this before. So when we came to reunion, we discovered beautiful people, all the colors of skin, everything that was in fact had been watched and I've been watching all over the world. People uh, the representatives of different religions, different uh, origins, and no war. No. At first, I believed it's like peaceful because there is a volcano. But later on, and then everybody could be scared that volcano falls on everybody and they disappear. But in fact, it's something that could come to the seed of the problem of why we don't have uh, understanding and why uh, ex-Prime Minister of 
England is complaining about multicultural society, reunion <clears throat> was not invaded. Reuni reunion was not imperial position of any imperialistic country around the world. It was an empty island and people started coming without somebody who was uh, sitting on the top of the island. So there is no historical heritage which we could find in Jamaica. Jamaica today is open problem forever because of Spanish uh, uh, who came long, long time ago and who killed every single local inhabitant and then they started bringing the slaves. A reunion is an example of successful, I would say, multicultural society because of the prehistory that does not include uh, somebody who comes, who kills, and who brings. On this island, people came, people came by the boats, and as the first, as they step, they afterwards they discovered uh, the society in which there is no a problem of living together in between Hindus, Catholics, and the others. So we could, I could conclude, in fact, that multicultural society is not uh, possible fully because it was very difficult to develop pyramid and no history like we have all what we watch on our computer. Every single island on this planet and every single country has its own history that is usually uh, interpreted differently from what happened. Because once you have a three eyes, a, a three pairs of eyes looking into the history, history is just vanishing as a truth. It becomes something that uh, could be placed more into mythology. So my experience of this island is saying that it could have been, could it be in the future, I don't know because I'm afraid that uh, much stronger impulses are leading uh, humanity than just uh, facts. And when I come each time to Geneva, I feel uh, very good because I know that uh, in Geneva all these relationships could be at least maintained on the level of accepting and respecting each other. Why is that? Uh, it's because of also, uh, uh, Switzerland is not a country that became peacefully what it is today, but it's also a compromise and good compromise for all what was going on from the medieval age up till now. If you go to Kosovo, you will find another reality. You will find, uh, uh, I would say, uh, by default, the civilization that does not care about its roots. If you go to Athens, you will see that Acropolis was, was bombed by the most powerful one in the World War II. If you go to Baghdad, you will be witnessing that the most powerful country in the world today was devastating all the signs of, of the, the first steps of civilizations. And then if you project your wishes to the other side and if you want to be uh, somebody who could uh, help the life of developing a multicultural society, then you have to be really going from one, one to another place in order to understand from what kind of roots people grow. In the case of South East Europe, it's very difficult because as Ivo Andrić and I will conclude with this, wrote, we always start our wars without a knowledge why did we start it. When we finish next one, we don't know why did we start it, but we feel that the one that will, coming, will be coming afterwards will start to solve the problem that we didn't solve before.
Thank you, Mr. Kusurisa. Let me ask a first question before opening the floor to uh, the audience. Uh, what is the relationship between multiculturalism and globalization? I think it's uh, the best possible idea when the uh, world that is globalized by the power of technology, he uh, probably the intention is to make it uh, as a communication so you could create multicultural uh, societies. But as you see, as much as we develop our technological capacity, we are less and less capable of communicating. Mm, possibly, yes. Yes, yes. Very possibly, yeah. All right. Let, let me open the floor to, uh, to the audience and see whether there are any questions. Yes, there is a question here. Yes, you need a mic. Could you introduce yourself and then ask your question? Right. Uh, my name is Marat Chagorowski, journalist um, based here in Geneva. I've met a few times Samir, and actually um, I love his movies uh, starting from... Well, the first one I saw probably was uh, Papa is in... Um, was it called a business trip or... Uh, yeah. Yes. What, yeah. And what then, is your question, wait, wait sorry? Wait a second. And then I, under, in Cannes, I was underground. I was, you were a great filmmaker, a great musician, a great actor, too. You played the Russian spy. Oh, yeah, you remember. Yeah, you did. So uh, now, Emir, uh, the question I would like to ask you, the first time I visited your country was in 1988. I was still uh, in high school. Um, I went, actually, um, I was based in Cetinia. Sorry, in your question Wait is? a second. Yes. Wait a second. Yes. Wait a second. Wait a second. Now, um, I, uh, and uh, I was, uh, so I visited only Montenegro and This is very interesting, Croatia. but you yeah. do have a question, now, don't the, you? Wait a second, I'm uh, used to asking questions, okay? So okay, yes. uh, let me finish, one second. You ask it, yes. Okay, so um, actually I was seeing a lot of people singing Yugoslavia, you know, they were proud of their country. And, um, well, I saw different religions. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that a few years later it would disintegrate. At that time, were you, what would you, I mean, if somebody would have told you, listen, uh, in a few years after the death of Tito, there'll be war and everything would happen, would you believe him or say he's crazy fool? I mean, what was your opinion at that time, end of the 1980s? It, you know, the, the many people uh, do not understand, and me neither to the end, even I have a, a lot of arguments for what happens, but it happens abruptly, it happens each time for the same reason. Uh, you have, <clears throat> you have a, a, a civilizations and cultures are crossing to each other. And as I said before, when Europe is feeling a sickness, we first get prescriptions to, to get better. And then the war starts. Thank you. There is another question. Yes, there's a question here. Well, uh, I, I guess I got Sorry. microphone. Yes. Should I continue? No, no, uh, this, the, the lady here and then uh, up there, yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Defna Gönac, I'm a PhD student at the Institute. Um, if you are to compare the approach to multiculturalism of Yugoslavia to the one of the European Union today, um, what would you say? What would be the weaknesses and strengths of both projects, according to you? You know, I'm, I'm afraid that the European Union is not in the best shape today. And not saying that, like somebody who doesn't wish Europe to be good. First of all, we have an uh, economic unity which on the political level is uh, almost like reconstruction of Soviet Union. You have commissars, commissariats, you have uh, people who are not voted, people who just delegated from some centers of power and they just go forward. And at the same time, you have uh, economies which are the strongest and they do not respect uh, what, what happens. And very often, it, I think, once Europe left Yugoslavia to be destructed so savagely, now we are at the door of the hell that is opening in Spain, which was uh, uh, contrary to what happens to us with Kosovo. 
Okay. There was a question up there, yes, from... Yes. Thank you. Um, Emir, are you, Do you uh, well, I'm Jovan Kurbalia, yeah. and uh, the, well, that's, uh, so far, Emir, I've been following you through the, let's say, emotional lenses, through your movies and your music, and it's first time that I'm following your rational arguments, and it's interesting dichotomy, we discussed it, we mentioned it when you were coming, yes. emotional. Your my question is? My first question is, you argue that miscommunication and the lack of understanding is one of the reasons for disintegration of Bosnia. I would uh, challenge your argument. Before the end of the Bosnia, you had a country which organized Olympic game, which produced supersonic airplane in Mostar, and which had the producing of close to 60% for the nuclear plant around Energo Invest around Sarajevo. It was the country. F to do this, you need engineers, you need, you need really educated culture, you, uh, educated uh, uh, civil society. Now, is this layer, my question is, is this civilizational, rational layer so thin, and we witnessed it in Germany before, that it can be easily scratched and we can get from the rational layer to emotional? This question is crucial for the future of humanity because currently we are discussing interplay between rational and emotional, from Silicon Valley to Moscow, Beijing, uh, Geneva, places worldwide. What is that interplay based on the, my argument that in Bosnia we dealt with a relatively advanced, at least technically relatively advanced society? It was uh, the case because Tito's Yugoslavia was uh, uh, fueling weapons Iraq to Iran at the same time. So this comes to the bottom question uh, of humanity. Uh, how much humanity is uh, uh, fertilized by the, the, the evil side of, of, of even small country like Yugoslavia. Because if you produce a lot of weapons, like Tito did, he was uh, making a surplus of $4 billion in the 70s by selling weapons. So all what you say is good. I have a jacket which represents the pilots from this period. And I have never had nothing against the unity of the country that is so diverse. But the problem is democracy came and destroyed it. Okay. Are there other questions? Yes, there's a question here. Um, my name is Selma Memek, and I'm a student here. Uh, I'm studying international relations here in Geneva. Uh, you talked about Sarajevo, and I was wondering if you, you still believe that uh, Sarajevo, today's Sarajevo, is a symbol of multiculturalism. Absolutely not. Why Absolutely. is that? Because of the, 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 the flow of history, which has uh, uh, happened that all the ethnic groups regrouped during the war and they are just uh, uh, living separately from each other. Unlike you could read in many uh, propagandist newspapers or uh, freelancers who are just telling the lies. All ethnic groups in Balkans, except Belgrade. Belgrade is still accepting the idea of multi-ethnicity and you could find uh, all the nations over there and even doing good business or doing, or doing uh, art. But uh, territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina is absolutely not multi-ethnic multi or multicultural. Other questions? Yes, there's a question back here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jepreet, and I'm also a student here at the Graduate Institute. When multiculturalism is discussed on the political level. There is a lot of talk of um, the compromise of culture um, in order to achieve true integration and therefore successful multiculturalism. And to what extent do you agree with that? I do agree absolutely with the process that was taken by Francois Mitterrand and all the French efforts not to assimilate but to in integrate 
And we are witnessing today that uh, this uh, project is highly unsuccessful. Unfortunately, I'm, uh, all what I say is what I see, but I'm not saying that I'm happy because France, France is the country in which we launched our uh, genre, so-called uh, world music. I have found the first big stage to show my movies in France. And I think everybody was somehow getting a goods, or as they say, bon air, from, from, from France. But if we look today, uh, people who came to France, they are not assimilated, neither integrated. They are the enemies of of uh, French system, which is for me astonishing and which is even bigger issue, I think, than, than what was rep repetitive uh, trouble that we were doing in Balkans. Other questions? Yes, Amalia de Lemure at the top, yes. Um, I have a question because I'm not sure that I have understood your point. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, my name is Emmanuel Delemula. I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher here at the Institute. And my question is concern, concerns your uh, idea about uh, multiculturalism in Yugoslavia. Because I'm not, it is not clear to me your opinion about that. Do you, uh, do you mean that Yugoslavia was multicultural until democracy came and then democracy destroyed everything? Because if that's the case, I would challenge the fact that democracy was the problem, but the problem probably was that there was a dictatorship first, and then uh, this dictatorship didn't really um, manage to create a very strong identity because it was based on repression and also some... Uh, there was no, um, the, it didn't deal with some historical grievances between, uh, for instance, Serbs and Croats, uh, and there was no, try, no, no attempt to try to heal some historical wounds uh, that were uh, uh, created between different groups during, uh, during the Second World War or even before. So, I mean, is democracy the problem, or was that dictatorship was going to fall in any case, and that would have uh, led, in any case, to uh, civil war or to uh, major conflicts between the different ethnic groups? I think, uh, first of all, I was not saying that democracy was a problem. I said the trouble started when democracy came. And on the other hand, I absolutely disagree with you that there was a dictatorship. This is, you are too young to, to have any experience of dictatorship. Dictatorship in Yugoslavia never existed. This was a very firm regime that was standing in between the Western world and Russia. Tito was somebody who was opposing Stalin and who made his own concentration camps to divert and to make better society. And it was, uh, as much as I remember, with Burma and with a few other systems, uh, one of the most progressive self, whatever it's called, uh, defined uh, uh, socialist system. So, first of all, we cannot speak about dictatorship. We could speak, and that's the reason why many people make mistakes, because you cannot speak about Croatia and Romania the same way you do. Then you become like, they, you make the same mistakes people do when they speak against democracy. Democracy came, people voted, for the worst people chosen in these all different territories. So we cannot say that uh, a dictatorship was guilty because Yugoslavia was much more open than any other Eastern country. But then you could come to another story. You had much stronger dictatorship in Czech Republic and Czechoslovakia was splitting with no problems. <clears throat> I have my personal opinion. In Serbia, people drink rakia, but in, in Czech Republic, they drink too much beer, and they are un under of anesthesia of uh, the effect of drinking a lot of beers. Mm -hmm. Well, we should all drink more beer, I suppose. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Gianluca Burci, I'm an adjunct professor here at the Institute. Uh, in the description of your talk, there was some, a lot about art, the value of art. And if you could elaborate a little bit on this, because historically art has been the celebration of power, economic, religious, economic power, versus a more modern, idealistic idea of art as a universal language that can unite, that transcends differences to promote multiculturalism. How do you feel about that as an artist, as an observer of contemporary art? I'm very happy you raised this question because 
this is somehow a continuation of what is dictatorship, what is not. We had, and now uh, it's uh, one of the paradoxes that I just want to put emphasis on. When I first came to China a few years ago, uh, I recognized that the most famous film ever shown in China was uh, Walter Defends Sarajevo, which is a, a, a kind of sweet version of partisan idealistic strip cartoons. And if you go to China today, they all sing all the songs from, from this movie. So Yugoslavia was on one side, on the official level, a country in which we produced many good artifacts. But I want to speak about literature, Serbian literature and Croatian literature and Slovenian literature was, I think, richest in the oldest region. Not just because we had the Nobel Prize, a guy who created a novels, we could say it's a, for us like Old Testament. We had the painters, we had the uh, documentarists, we had good football, we had, uh, we had uh, Yugoslavia was winning many times in, in, in basketball, the world. We were beating even Americans in basketball. So you had a country which was simply, from today's point of view, a project. Like you have today NATO project. Yugoslavia was a project that was destroyed mainly by those who created the project and by the, by the time that was just uh, producing contradicting elements which killed the existence of this. Not in each republic the same because it's much more complicated, because this could go further away. But if you have a chance to look at Lubarda paintings, if you have a chance to see Sh Shumanovic, if you, you know, you will be positively surprised how the 200 years after the First Balkanic War, after which all these republics, starting with Serbia and then even uh, Croatia and, and Slovenia and all of them, they were even more eager to go to Yugoslavia than most of the Serbs, after, especially after the World War I. So if you look at this entity, you could uh, be encyclopedic and you could find uh, uh, that this country of Yugoslavia had equals, uh, I would say, the same like Poland, even with the half, halfway uh, population, because they are much bigger than us. So this was a great country, destroyed, uh, uh, I would say, more from outside than inside. We, we had taken this challenge, which was repetitive, and I hope one day people will stop using the words to revenge to each other. And this is the main name of this. The question is, who fueled and who destroyed the platform for which uh, you could say, uh, all the symptoms and everything that you could find in the history of this country, you could find incredible achievements, which, if you don't know the history, if you don't know what happens afterwards or before, you could be very surprised how come that such a, uh, what this gentleman uh, said, how apparently all of this was destroyed. This was destroyed because most of the historical processes during the Tito's regime were not solved were kept under the, under the carpet. But symptoms of civilization easily to be, to be found and to be listed. Thank you. Uh, question here, yes. Thank you, hello. My name is Milan Bidot. I'm here as an independent researcher on cultural rights as human rights. Um, uh, you talk a lot about history. And I think that is uh, very important uh, when we talk about multiculturalism. Um, my um, entry point would not be multiculturalism, but the need to respect cultural diversity, which is a fact. You can't uh, think or believe that there is no cultural diversity. It is here, and it is, for, it is here forever. And if you have uh, an approach based on cultural rights, uh, regarding, for example, the issue of history, uh, then um, you, you will conclude that what you need is the right of everyone 
to have access to his, his own history, but also to the narrative of the other. And uh, to, Sir, to your question is? My question will be whether Mr. Kusturica uh, uh, agrees or not with what I'm developing. History is really, uh, sorry, I, I don't want to be too please, long, but don't develop it you too can't much. talk about <laughs> <laughs> So do you think, Mr. Kusturica, that um, having an approach based on cultural rights as human rights can help developing uh, multicultural policies uh, which will be successful? You know, today it's very difficult to achieve any idealistic goal because all idealism and utopia, uh, they, they are vanishing and somebody, uh, when you say I'm idealistic, I want to achieve this, they say this guy is fool. How can you do this without money? So everything comes to this, uh, uh, I would say, profane element of life. I have done something that I believe is very much based on this. I have my own village, wooden village, in which now I have three festivals. And I bring to the film festival people, people from all over the world. And uh, six days, they enjoy a multicultural life in the best possible way. So idealistically, it is possible, practically, I think we don't bring another element which is a unifying element of technology that is the most severe. If we go to cinema, if we go to video games, if we go to this artificial world, we could be just crying. This world is becoming something that has no identity and not just having no identity itself, it crushes our identity. So this is what is also a big problem. My cultural identity, if it's worth existing, and I think it is, not just mine, but everybody's, if we go to the point of uh, uh, new uh, air, an artificial world that is created by all this Netflix, all this da-da-da, we don't have artifacts like we had based on what I was asked here. Uh, the air is filled with stupidity, which has to be put in exchange for something. We, in England, we don't have a Joseph Losey. We don't have a great names. We have a, a still some names that are attracting our att att attention, which are coming out of social problems of England, like Ken Loach. But this is ending period. Next step will be, why I'm saying this, Next step will be even less diversity because of the language that is absolutely changed. The language of cinema nowadays is a language of commercials. The speed of expression, not f uh, uh, freedom of expression. I would call it speed of expression because everything is squeezed into the tiny space where we could realize our illusions and our world. So less and less space for what we need, and this is what is called cultural diversity. We are going to be, one day, the sky will fall on us and we will be absolutely unable to express ourselves. Well, thank you. There's a question up there. Zoran Lazarov. I'd like to ask you a question. That Sorry, your microphone doesn't seem to be working. Hello? Okay, yes, okay. that's fine. My name is Zoran Lazarov. I'm coming from Basel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Macedonian. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask a question that is a little bit of a paradox. Is it the only chance for the multiculturalism to work? Renouncing of nationalism? Mm -hmm. That's all. <laughs> Unfortunately, you cannot get people. Uh, you cannot. It might be if you kindly ask them not to be nationalist anymore. It could be uh, perfect, but uh, I don't think it's possible to erase all those uh, people who structure every society. And if you start fighting nationalism, then you are going to give 
a big chance to another type of nationalism, which is, uh, you know, might be we could one day start thinking that people who like to eat hamburgers, they are American nationalists. So it's very difficult to go deeply into this subject, but uh, without, uh, without free view to the world, without, I would call it like this, without internationalistic ideas, we cannot move forward. But I don't think nationalism is the only problem why we cannot put uh, together uh, multicultural societies. Look at France. France was passing through the different per periods of history in which, in my village where I used to live, uh, the secretary of community was, uh, her name was Madame Chauvin which means that nationalism in the beginning of 19th century was integrated into society. Then, de Gaullism, which was desperately trying to keep France together with all the habits which some of them could be called nationalist. Then, they moved forward. They stopped to be nationalist, they became politically correct. They made a system in which almost every foreigner, especially from ex-colonies of France, could have been integrated they didn't want to be integrated mostly. They didn't want to be assimilated, which is okay. And in the end, uh, no result. I am not, and this is a good, good place to say, I am not nationalist. I do not respect nationalism because this is extreme level, but I do like traditional culture of my country and I have a deep respect to the past so this has to be uh, divided, and this, is, this has to be marked, because today everybody who says, I like mythology, if you don't, a mythology of uh, Hollywood, then they say you are nationalist. So this is very vague also. Uh, the truth is that not Tito's dictatorship was on the transfer of ex-Yugoslavia to uh, to, to new time, to the war. It was nationalism that was given legitimacy by the West. They were given this democratic, and they were speaking to them, not to us, people who tried to be internationalist and who were supporting, if you remember, Mr. Markovic's uh, party, which was absolutely on the other side. But politics, they go for what they can. This is very realistic, like on the marketplace. And they did it. So I would always separate sense of traditional culture. You know, you could easily come to the conclusion that uh, if I like to, 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 to read some old books, I could be, become named nationalist, but this is not true. So nationalism is dangerous but feeling a nation, it's necessary, because otherwise you lose your roots, and then you could, you could identify yourself with a skyscraper, not with the history. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, uh, if there is any. Yes, there is one there. Hi, um, my name is Helena Hahn. I'm also a student um, at the Graduate Institute, and I have a question about language and multiculturalism, um, namely whether you think that multiculturalism presupposes or only can work if there's a common language. Um, I'm thinking about the sort of the refugee crisis and then um, n a number of European governments realizing that there must be an institutionalized way for refugees and migrants to learn the local language. Um, and so I'm wondering whether um, we can have a number of different cultures coexist only with a common language or whether it can also work a different way. As I told you, in the Roman Empire, uh, the, the poets uh, who left uh, their verses, they say that, that, that in Rome you could have heard many different names from all the provinces because of the system that, uh, especially during the, the, uh, the, the reign of Hadrianus, when everybody was coming to see the new uh, building, and they were all coming from the provinces. 
if everybody goes to United Nations today in, in New York, everybody speaks di different language. So now uh, there is an intention, but each time when it comes to, uh, to, to create a good ambience for this, then you have uh, something that is unexpected. Uh, globalism was a chance, but globalism which is m uh, further far away from, from uh, colonialism. If we have a, glo a global idea of global village which is achieved by technology, but if we go, if we step further, and when we find uh, uh, the the number of illiterate people in the near small city of Kakanj in Bosnia or in Afghanistan, then we come to the trouble in which decision to be made must be uh, you, uh, uh, connected to use of power. Once you use the power, you create a war. Without war, economy doesn't work, and we come always to, uh, I would say very conservative and very classical problem that we have to solve in its roots. That's why I started this panel with idea, when you come to the marketplace, you bring goods that somebody else doesn't, and then on marketplace, as I understand today in the shopping malls, people don't make trouble to each other. But once they start creating institutions, once they start uh, looking for more rights, once, once they uh, see how the societies are imperfect, then multiculturalism comes as a final response to inability to, to do something that you want to do. And especially now in Europe, when you have, uh, uh, how they call it, influx of uh, people who come, and I will be always on their side because uh, there was somebody uh, in Guardian speaking about how the multicultural society is vibrant, more vivid, how the refugees bring their own. And if you look at who was a refugee in the history of science, you will be surprised how big names are in fact com coming from nowhere. So the question how to connect nowhere with somewhere uh, regarding the rules of the political games uh, regarding uh, power of uh, centers in Europe which are mostly concentrated, I think, in Germany because this is the most powerful economy. Uh, we have to believe that this is possible. But this is possible also uh, when we change our mind. How can we change the mind in which before when we spoke just one little part of our brain is rational we carry on a uh, much bigger surface of something we, we don't know for what it is. And if we combine the two elements, my conclusion is, as I was stepping into this house, is that if you have a society that is rich, you could afford multiculturalism. If you are poor, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that this is almost impossible. Thank you. On that, on that note, let, let, let us end and let us thank Mr. Kusturica for his talk and his answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good.